That plaque that you're seeing on the up above me is on the campus of Northwestern University in Evingston, Illinois. It was September the 6th or 8th, uh, uh, one of the other, 1860, when there was a collision on Lake Michigan with the schooner, the Augusta, and a passenger steamboat by the name of the Lady Elgin. The wreck occurred about 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, young champion swimmers of Northwestern University were awakened in the middle of the night and urged to rush down to the shores of Lake Michigan and to see what they could do to help in the rescue. One of those young, experienced champion swimmers was a man, young man by the name of Edward Spencer. And so they rushed down to the shores. Immediately, Edward grabbed a rope, put it around his waist, dove into the frigid waters of Lake Michigan, unable to see anything in the darkness of the night, but he could hear, he could hear the frantic cries of people who were drowning. When he arrived to the first person, he saw people everywhere hanging on to debris from the wreckage, barely able to breathe, and some of them had already drowned. And so he wrapped that rope around the first person he reached, gave a yank to the rope behind, and they pulled him and that person to shore. And then he dove back into the waters. And for six long hours, the length of time that our Lord was on the cross, Ed Spencer went back and forth and back and forth, time after time, trying to rescue one person after the other until eventually... His body collapsed from exhaustion on the shore. They rushed him in an ambulance to the hospital along with others that were being rescued. When he awoke in the emergency room, his brother Bill, William, was right there at his side. Right out of his mouth immediately, he said, Will, did I do my full duty? Did I do my best? Will said, Ed, you saved 17 people. And with that story, I want to ask us a penetrating question, each of us. Please open up your heart and your mind and your will to this question. And the question is, are you, are we, doing our full duty to do our best to rescue those who are perishing spiritually, drowning in their sins and hell-bound. I want us to look into the Old Testament in the book of Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 7, and I want us to think about a day of good news. Here's a great rescue that occurs in the city of Samaria. These people are not drowning in water. They are starving to death. And as we look at the details of this story, I want us to look at four different scenes, and I want us to put ourselves in that situation and see what is God trying to tell us with this story of Elisha and the rescue of those in Samaria and how these four lepers were used by God to save these people's lives. I want you to see, first of all, the uh, severe desperation. If you have your Bibles open, turn to chapter 7. We read in verse 3, Now there were four men who were lepers at the gate, at the entrance of the gate. And they said one to another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. But if we sit here, we die also, and so now come, let us go over to the camp of the Assyrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. It is a serious desperation 
and for two reasons. First of all, Ben-Hadad has surrounded the city of Samaria. He's cut off all entrance in the city and out of the city. The people are running out of food. There's only five horses left in the town. In chapter 7 and verse 13, it says, A multitude has already died, and Ben Hadad uh, and Jehoram, the king, the wicked king, who is walking in the footsteps of Jeroboam and his sins, all the, all the, the, the kings of the northern kingdom, as you know your Jewish history of that era, every one of them were wicked. Jehoram was no different. Instead of calling for national repentance, realizing their suffering is the result of their sins, and calling on everybody to put on sackcloth and ashes and pray, and maybe God will rescue us, what does he do? He blames Elisha. He blames the prophet. He sends the captain up to Elisha's house and says, Before this day is over, his head will roll. Elisha's got a different response. Elisha says, anybody's head's going to roll today, uh, 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 before the day's over, it's going to be you. And prices are going to stabilize. You see, what was happening is things got so bad that donkey heads were being sold for, and, and dove poop. You had that for supper last night, right? For ridiculous prices. And so here are these four lepers. And they had uh, been forced into begging, but there was nobody going in and out of the city. The garbage that was over the walls for them was no longer being eaten by them. It was being eaten by the people in Samaria. Nobody is going to give a crumb to crummy lepers. It is a severe desperation. And when I see this, and when I study this, it gives me a picture, and I want you to see that picture, of the, the helplessness and the hopelessness of, and the sinfulness and the wickedness of the world in which we live. The depravity of humanity is getting worse and worse every day. There were women in that city that were cannibalizing their own children. And we live in a world that is, crea is committing every abominable sin that you can think of, and it is spiritually cannibalizing itself. But God has placed upon our shoulders a responsibility, a commission. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. And Mark's account is about the same. He says, go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. The world is separated from God. The world outside of Christ is condemned in their sins. We've got to understand that. We've got to come to grips with that serious desperation of people in this world. In, Mar in Luke's account of the Great Commission, he said, This will behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. In John's account, Jesus said, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And then before he left up, According to Luke's account in Acts 1, I've made you witnesses, my witnesses. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And according to Colossians 1, within 30 years, the gospel was preached to the whole world. The early Christians did not wring their hands saying, what, has this, what, what is this world coming to? Rather, they were saying, what has come into the world? And so that severe desperation, get that scene fixed in your minds. 
And then I want us to see the surprising discovery. Look over at chapter 7 again. Look at verse 5. And so they arose at the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. You see, these guys had three choices. They could go into the city, and that would be against the law and custom, and they could be stoned to death. They could stay where they were and die of starvation like everybody else. Or they could get up and go into uh, the Syrian camp and hope that maybe they'll give them a few morsels of bread and spare their lives, or at the worst, give them a speedy and merciful death by running the sword through them. And so there they are. And here we are looking at the severity of sin in this world, realizing all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our world is helpless and hopelessly lost, and we have the gospel in our hands. So now look at the surprising discovery. They get up and they go into the camp. Can you imagine their bewilderment, their surprise? When they get there, the camp's empty. Everybody's gone. Nobody's around anywhere. You see, God in the night has, cre- has performed a, a mighty miracle, uh, an, an audible miracle, in which all of these Syrians think that the King Jehoram has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to come up against them, and so they all flee. And not only do they think they're fleeing for their lives, they leave all of their spoils of war behind, all their wealth. And so here are these lepers. I mean, they've got more refreshment, they've got more riches, they've got more raiment than they've ever had in their lives. And so that's the situation you see. For the Lord, verse 6, had made the army of the Syrians to hear the sound of chariots and horses and the sound of the great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt, and they come against us. And so they fled in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their, ho- or their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into, the, uh, into a tent, and they ate, and they drank, and they carried off the gold and clothing, and they went and hid them. And then they came back, and they entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. I mean, these guys are partying all night. They're having a grand old time. The Lord has worked in a mysterious and miraculous way in behalf of those Samaritans and those lepers when they didn't deserve it. But God's going to rescue them. And he's going to use these four lepers to bring that about. And when I think about this situation, here they were beggars. And now they have become hoarders of the loot that they have surprisingly discovered. An unexpected abundance. Their surprising discovery gives us a glimpse of God's love, does it not? Help us to understand God's love and God's grace, how he provides salvation for lost humanity in spite of our sinfulness. We serve a merciful Redeemer who paid the price for our salvation, and he desires for all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and he works through us to accomplish that mission in this world. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, he has given us all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And so here we are this morning worshiping, and we have traded our garments of unrighteousness, Isaiah 64, verse 8, for garments of salvation. Righteous garments of salvation. God has blessed us 
with the riches of His grace, even the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, verse 7. He's translated us out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1, and uh, verse 14. And aren't we blessed today? But brethren, if we have found something vital in Jesus Christ, and we have, we've got to be vocal in Christ Jesus. We cannot remain silent. If we have had our lives transformed by the power of the gospel, we've got to be transmitting that gospel. And so here's the surprising discovery. We're all the children of God this morning by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And thank the Lord that you've done that. But the crucial question, once we're saved and become children of God, is this. Will we selfishly keep to ourselves these spiritual blessings that we have surprisingly discovered in the Savior? As one person said, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And we've got to be busy about the Father's business of doing that. Are we doing our full duty? Are we doing our best to share the spiritual blessings that we've received in Christ with others, or are we doing our worst by staying silent? And then look at this scene. There's serious dilemma. Verse uh, 9 is really the key to this story. Then they said to one another, We're not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Aren't you thankful that, that these men, these lepers, who, who, who are so excited, who are overjoyed uh, 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 about their, what they have now found, but, 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 but unfortunately, they, they're not thinking about the suffering and the starving people in Samaria. But all of a sudden, their conscience begins to convict them, and they begin to realize that they were worse off than everybody else, and now they are better shaped than anybody else. And their serious dilemma was that if they continued to hoard and to hide their newfound blessings instead of cheerfully sharing it with others that need a greater blessing, a greater curse, a, a, a worse suffering will come upon them than they have ever experienced as lepers. And so they reasoned that it was their responsibility to share these blessings with others. It is a day of good news. Let's go tell it. Today, all Christians face a serious dilemma in evangelism. I haven't always realized it in my own life. And that is, if we not only have the duty to do our best to share the gospel with those who are lost, but brethren, if we are silent, if we do nothing, then we're going to be lost. Jesus wants me to win others to him. And I've got to take that seriously. The church is too complacent. We've gotten too fat and satisfied. We cannot be indifferent to the lost condition of our neighbors and our friends right around us here in the greater Texarkana. But the majority of the people in this world are not in the state of Texas, as big as it is. They're outside the borders of the USA. They're in Asia, and Africa, and Europe, and Mexico, and South America. And we've got to be about the Father's business of taking that gospel to others. A survey was taken in the general evangelical community that I read about recently in which it was learned that 98% of people who call themselves Christians has never, ever even tried to win a friend or neighbor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another survey I read not long ago 
again, uh, just in churches in general throughout USA, not necessarily churches of Christ, but it may include some churches of Christ. And it was learned that 89% of the people answered to the question, what is the purpose of the church? You know what they said? To help me and my family. Now, of course, that's, I mean, we come here to be edified and to be strengthened. And if you need benevolence, this is a benevolent church. I'm sure they're going to help you with your physical needs. But that is not the primary mission of the church. Only 11% said the church exists to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, verse 10 describes the mission example of Jesus. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. Finally, I want you to see the sympathetic decision. Go back to verse 8, or rather verse 10. And they said, Now come, let us go tell the king's household. And so they came and they called the gatekeepers of the city and they told them, We came to the camp of the Assyrians and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard there and nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents uh, as they were. And the gatekeepers called out, and it was told within the king's household. Now the old king gets suspicious. You see, he's a wicked man. He has no understanding or appreciation of the providence of God. And so he's thinking, well, I tell you what, they, they, they worked out some kind of deal. This is a con deal. The, 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 the Syrians have worked a deal with these lepers to spare their lives, and, and they're going to pull us out into the camp of the enemy, and then they're going to kill us all out there. And so that's, that's uh, this, this is what's going on. Some of the people said, look, we've got five horses uh, uh, left. Uh, let's send some riders out and check it out. The least we can do is check it out. We're going to die. And so, and so they, they send two Two horses out, riders, and sure enough, it was just exactly like the lepers had said. And so we're told in verse 16, and the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians so that all of a sudden the prices have stabilized. Now everybody's eating turkey and cornbread, fried chicken, mashed taters. Man, they're having a feast. They hadn't eaten this good in a long time. What about those lepers? Those lepers had been mistreated and marginalized for years, just getting crumbs and garbage thrown over the wall. They could have said, those people in Samaria, they're getting what they deserve. Let them die. But that wasn't what they did, was it? They made the sympathetic decision to go and tell the king's household. And brethren, I'm here to tell you this morning, to remind you, I should say, because I know I'm talking to a missionary church, a church of compassion, sympathetic saints who realize that the gospel has been placed into our hands and it's our task to take the gospel to the world. God's looking for one more sympathetic saint. And our attitude has got to be come and see and go and tell. Just as God used these four lepers and his people in Samaria, the people who were starving and dying, God works through our hands and through our feet and through our mouths as compassionate, sympathetic saints. The clarion call of the church is summed up in these words. And we've got to come to grips with that. And I encourage you to think in that direction. I want to leave you with these words. And these words are, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait, punishment will overtake us. Let those words ring in your ears. Let them haunt you and arouse a greater passion for your neighbors, for your friends, your family who are lost right here in your city but especially to the millions throughout the world.
some time ago, I was looking on the Internet, and, and I ran across the name of another young man. His name was Edward also, Edward Young. He was a musician. He was a, a songwriter. And a hundred years after Ed Spencer's heroic rescue of 17 people, he read about that story, and he thought, well, there's some spiritual lessons in that. And so he wrote a song. And it has a number of penetrating questions that I want to leave with you this morning. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus, who died on that cruel tree? I think of his great sacrifices at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. I wonder, have I cared enough for others? Or, or, or have I let... Uh, or have I let them die alone? I might have helped a wanderer to the Savior, the seed of precious life I might have sown. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many? How many are the chained I've helped set free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? when he has done so much for me. Paul said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear except uh, without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Brethren, friends, this is a day of good things, of glad tidings that happen. And if you're not a Christian, God is inviting you to have your sins washed away. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Are you ready to repent of your sins and be buried with the Lord in baptism? You heard the words of the Great Commission of Jesus, not my words, the Lord's words. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so I encourage you this morning, get out of that pew, come, Brother Jerry will take your hand, will take your confession, and you can become a Christian today. But most of us are Christians this morning. And I pray there's no one here this morning that has left your first love. And I pray that that first love is Jesus Christ and you're sold out to Jesus. But I also pray that you have a love for the lost in your heart. A passionate sense of urgency that you cannot go through this week without sharing it with somebody that needs Jesus in their life. Aren't you thankful somebody taught you? Maybe it was Mama. Maybe it was Daddy. Maybe it was Jerry. Maybe it was one of these elders. Maybe a Bible teacher. Maybe a friend or a neighbor. That's a member here. And came to your door and shared the gospel with you. I pray that I might challenge us to realize that the clarion call of the church is to be about our Father's business. The invitation is extended as we stand and sing together.